Good evening, everyone. My name is Lizzie Wolf. I'm the rector here at St. George's. And I wanted us to take the time to read the end of Mark's gospel together, because there's nothing quite like hearing it straight from the Bible. It's a story of great suffering and evil that converges on the cross. But the cross changes everything. Defeat turns to victory. The end is actually a beginning. A story of evil turns out to be a story of profound, life-changing hope. So let's think first about the evil that we see in our story and how it might relate to the world around us. First, there's Pilate. Pilate is the political leader in Jerusalem. He's actually a puppet king put in place by the Roman colonial government. Pilate knows that Jesus hasn't committed a crime, but he's a crowd pleaser. He cares more about maintaining his own position, about whether people like him, than he does about doing the right thing. Now, I'm not going to make a political comment tonight by comparing him to particular world leaders, either now or in history. But if you feel angry about injustices caused by this sort of attitude, Know that Jesus understands. Next, the chief priests. Now, the chief priests are the religious leaders. They're the ones who are supposed to follow God, to do what's right, to care. But instead, they make false accusations, they stir up the crowd for their own ends, and they mock a dying man. Sadly, there are still examples of terrible failures by religious leaders today. Just 10 days ago, there was a report showing how many times the church has failed the survivors of abuse. If you've been affected by that, I want to say that I am deeply sorry. And we are committed to making St. George's a safe place for everyone, and to supporting survivors of any kind of abuse. Then, if we go back to our story from the Gospel, there are the soldiers. Now, the soldiers are not just doing their job. They choose to mock and abuse Jesus. They set a crown of thorns on his head and pretend to pay homage to him, all whilst hitting and spitting on him. Now, I don't know what that reminds you of, but for me, as I read it this time, it brought back those shocking images of police brutality, the killing of George Floyd and others. So we've got Pilate, the chief priests, the soldiers, and then finally the crucifixion itself, a horrifying, cruel form of torture there's a lot of evil in our reading. And Jesus doesn't stand at a safe distance. He is there in the midst of it. He is suffering in pain and brokenness. And he's still with those who are suffering today. But this story doesn't end as everyone was expecting, because the cross turns evil to hope. And that's what I want us to think about next. On the cross, Jesus dies with a loud cry. Out of a lifetime of biblical prayer comes a line of a psalm. Because he has lost contact with God, and yet he still reaches out to God to ask why. And as he dies, Mark gives us three signs of hope. You might think of them as clues, clues that give us hints as to what is really going on. First, there's the unexplained darkness 
that covers the land from noon until three in the afternoon. If you think back, in the very beginning, Genesis tells us there was darkness. And God started his creation by saying, let there be light. Now, once again, out of darkness comes new creation. At the cross, God deals decisively with the evil that spoils and destroys our world. He begins a new creation, a creation of freedom and glory, a creation with no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That great work of renewal and restoration will be finished when Jesus returns. But it began in the darkness of the cross. The second sign of hope is the temple curtain, which was torn in two from top to bottom as Jesus breathed his last. Now the temple symbolized God's presence with his people, with the curtain marking the most holy place. Tearing the curtain indicates the temple is as good as finished, just as Jesus has been prophesying. It has been superseded by what's taking place on the cross. Access to the living God is now open to everyone through the death of Jesus. If you want to come to God, you can, right here, right now. Now, there are some people in our church building tonight, but you don't have to go to a special place, a temple or a church building. And you don't have to do something special to make yourself clean or worthy. If you want to talk to Almighty God, you can, because of what Jesus did on the cross. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that through Jesus, we have access to the Father by one Spirit. The third sign of hope is the centurion who says, surely this man is the Son of God. The first person in Mark's Gospel to recognise Jesus' true identity isn't the high priest or a leading rabbi. It's not even a loyal disciple. It's a Roman executioner. The kingdom of God often surprises us. It's an upside down kingdom where things are done differently. God's values are different from the values of the world. God's own son dying on a cross because of love. Are you prepared to be surprised by God? So, darkness, the temple curtain, the centurion. Three signs of hope, clues, glimpses of deep truth, showing us that evil is not the end of the story because the cross changes everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like this is a message for our times. Do you need to connect to a sense of hope tonight? Next in our story, Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Now remember, Peter denied Jesus rather than take the risk of being associated with him. But Joseph of Arimathea takes that risk. He treats Jesus as family wrapping his body in the cloth and placing it in his tomb. Mark's account of the burial is quite short, but he still manages to head off a couple of potential rumours. Jesus is definitely dead. Pilate checks with the centurion. And the women see which tomb Jesus is laid in. So we can't say that they muddled up the different tombs when they arrived to anoint his body. Then there's a pause for the Sabbath. 
And on the third day, the women arrive with the spices to find an empty tomb. Like most people, their initial reaction to seeing an angel is alarm and fear. And then the story suddenly stops. Many theologians think that a very early copy of Mark's Gospel must have had the last page, or more accurately, the last column of the scroll, ripped off by accident. Most Bibles do have some more verses, Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, but they're usually in italics with a note of explanation. And they're probably a later addition by someone who realises what's happened and tries to fill in the gap. At Easter, we usually read the other Gospels to find out what happened. The women go back and tell the disciples the good news. The risen Jesus appears and he commissions his disciples. But I wonder if today we might stop here. We are, after all, focusing on Mark's Gospel. And I wonder if maybe stopping here might help us to see this story of evil and hope in a new way. To feel how surprising it is, how unexpected. And it's my prayer that we might feel its power afresh tonight. So as we prepare to receive Holy Communion, I'm going to leave you with some questions. What is God saying to you tonight? That is always a good question to ask. We believe that God speaks. What's he saying to you? And how are you going to step into this unfinished story? Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that on the cross you changed evil into hope. And we pray that you would help each one of us to connect with that hope tonight. Help us to feel it deep within. Help us to live in the light of that hope. We thank you too that we have access to Almighty God now. Would you help us even now to come to you, to bring our hearts before you, to receive from you. And show us, Lord, what part you want us to play in your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.